Well, good morning, everyone. Um, we don't have a lot on the agenda today, so we're hoping to leave some time for questions at the end of um, the slide um, presentation. And um, we will let people in, and this is being recorded. And uh, I think we're ready to start. Um, so I think Shelly can go to the next slide. So we did wanna wish everyone a safe and happy new school year. We know that many of you are starting school or maybe have already started school or you're starting school in the next a week or a few days. So we do wanna wish you, we know that you've had a pretty, um, a very, a lot of stressful time over the last couple of years. And so we're hoping that everything works out and you have a great and safe, happy start of the new school year. Um, we do appreciate all the work that you're doing. Um, and then on top of that, having to do all this other work um, that's related to the um, federal relief funding. So thank you for your hard work and um, good luck on a new school year. We have had some new members join our team. So I'm just gonna let everybody introduce themselves. I'll start with myself. I'm Monique Sullivan and I am the ARP SRA coordinator. Good morning, everyone. My name is Shelley Shasi Jandro. I'm the director of the Office of Federal Emergency Relief Programs. Good morning. My name is Kevin Harrington. I'm the new gear slash EANS coordinator. Good morning. I'm Karen Kuziak. I'm the coordinator of CARES, the ESER side of that, and Carissa, the ESER 2 side of that. Good morning, everyone. I am Maisha Shah. I am the fiscal coordinator. Good morning, my name is Robert Palmer and I'm the new management analyst. So at this point, we think our team is complete. Um, and so we have the programmatic side, which would you know, be Kevin and Karen and myself. And then we have the more of the financial fiscal side of it. And we have Maisha, Barbara and uh, Robert. So we are hopefully we have a complete team now. And so we can really, um, you know, address your concerns and get your applications and invoices processed as quickly as possible. So again, I always just try to start every um, presentation off with just, um, you know, a reminder of the purpose for ARP ESSER funds, and that is to uh, prevent and have mitigation strategies for COVID-19, um, specifically, I mean, to the best extent possible for CDC guidance. And there are a couple of slides um, in this presentation that talk about that because we have been getting some questions about um, the SEU plan for returned in-person instruction. And then also um, along with prevention and mitigation strategies for the safety of students and st uh, people in the school, um, it also is to address the impact uh, lost instructional time through evidence-based interventions that respond to the academic, social, emotional, and mental health needs of all students, um, and particularly underserved student groups. Uh, yeah. So be before we get started, I just wanna go ahead and do some updates. Um, we did notice there's quite a few new coordinators um, for ESSER, um, for ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, and for gen in general, to some of all the federal funding, relief funding. Um, so we have a, a page, um, a slide on slide six that shows how to update your contact information in GEM so that you can get any of the GEM um, notifications. We tend, if we're gonna send out something generally to the field, we try to do it through the GEM notification system. Um, unless it's something really that we need to send through um, our newsroom, which will come through a priority notice. Just a reminder again that CRF, um, you need to finish your invoicing by September 1st, uh, 2021. Um, and we have Maisha and um, Robert that are working with those invoicing. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to any one of us but if it's specific to like invoicing, Maisha or Robert would probably be the person that you would um, talk to directly. Uh, we are doing daily review of CARES ESSER 1 and Carissa ESSER 2 applications, and that's pretty much Karen, um, but we all look at them together um, at times um, just to kind of get a, a whole team approach to that. And then the review, we are reviewing um, the ESSER, ARP ESSER 3 applications, 
I know I'm reviewing them, I'm providing feedback, uh, but I just wanna put a caveat on there that um, our state plan has not been officially approved um, for our for the AARP ESSER funds. So even though I may have provided feedback and you um, have resubmitted your application, I'm kind of at a standstill at that point because we can't approve applications until we get approval for our state plan. So we're hoping that'll come soon um, and that we can start um, moving forward with that process. Um, I think we're good. And then the new quarter coordinator site, up, site setup, if you just go to the um, four PC main um, and go to the um, American Rescue Plan, um, um, I don't know what it's called, the little tab there. And then you go to your, um, really handy, but you go to the um, data met entry menu and it'll say application um, setup. You click on that. That'll bring you to the application setup page. And then you can uh, update your superintendent's information. And you can also update your um, contact information for actually the person who's filling out the, um, the application. I know some of you are, are very experienced at GEM and others of you are not. And sometimes we get questions about, do I need my own password um, and login? The way the GEM system works is that only one person can have access to the application. So um, a lot of districts just have, um, you know, they work it out who's going to be doing the application, the physical application uh, of that piece. Superintendents get a separate login um, and um, password to be able to approve the applications once they've been submitted by the person that is actually, actually, actually doing the application itself. So there's a question in the chat that says, if the state approval is delayed, will the ARP SR3 due date be revised? Um, no, at this point, because uh, we there is a deadline uh, that's written in the law that says that we have um, we have to have it we have to have a set timeline. Um, and so at this point in time, we are not changing that deadline because we're following what the um, the law says. Now, if that changes and the um, U.S. Department of Education um, says that we can extend that, um, then we will. But I mean, Shelly may be able to speak more to this, but I don't anticipate um, them giving us any leeway on that at all. So, um, but Shelly may be able to speak to that um, more directly. So the deadline is in place based on statutory language within the law. We have a meeting with uh, the team from the US Department of Education just last week we anticipate having our state plan approved in the next week or so based on the timeline that we discussed with the U.S. Department of Education. But we, we like to be sure that we put that caveat that right now, we as a department, which means you folks, since we are your pass-through agency, only have two-thirds of our funding. If it becomes problematic where our state plan will need some additional revisions, Unlikely with the conversation that we had last week with the US Department of Education. But if that becomes the case, we may need to revise the allocations to reflect those two thirds of the funds that we have in place to be able to start uh, seeking reimbursement for you folks. At this time, that is not our goal. Our goal is really for you to think about your 100% allocation and identify needs and students that could utilize these funds. So that is our goal. Like I said, we had a conversation with the US Department of Education just last week. We are in constant communication with them and submitting additional materials for our ARP state plan. And we are keeping a close eye on our email communications and our contacts at the US Department of Education so that we can provide additional information to you folks as soon as that state plan has been approved. And I also just wanna add that I was a part of that meeting and the US Department of Education was very, um, you know, they wanted to work with us. They wanted, they want our plan to get to get approved. And they, they really, it wasn't, it was a very um, collaborative process and it wasn't like, you know, we're not going to approve it. it was what can we do? We can help you get this um, plan approved. So it was very, it wasn't, they want us to get our, our plan approved as well. So I think it's, it's going to be coming hopefully in the, a week or two. 
or maybe sooner. So we don't know. Okay. So um, as I said, I've been reviewing um, applications as they're coming in. Um, and these are just, again, some um, findings that I've, that I've found, just some uh, things that I want to highlight um, about documentation and evidence, publicly available plans, and relevance and timeliness of the applications. So again, this is just more of a reminder, a friendly reminder. Um, when I'm reading the applications, I'm also thinking about what reporting will look like in the fall. And um, because we will have, um, you know, like with ESCA um, applications and IDA, you will have performance reports that you're going to have to complete. Um, and so just thinking ahead, like if you had to, um, what could you show as evidence that this is happening? So it's not that you're not doing it. It's just a reminder, a friendly reminder keep to, um, to keep doing it if you are. And if you aren't just like, oh yeah, I've got to remember to do that. So again, just keep documentation and evidence of overlapping pro uh, project expenses funded. Um, and this includes time and effort um, with ESSER and CRF um, monies. So this comes to think, I know um, several districts have been have put in for a coordinator for their um, federal relief funds, and they're funding it out of a lot of different um, funding sources. Some are coming out of ESSER 2, some are coming out of ESSER 3. Um, and you just want to make sure that you keep track of that separately on the time and effort um, documentation, uh, because it is not consolidated. So you do have to keep track of like how much time they worked on ESSER 1, I'm sorry, how much time they worked on ESSER 2, how much time they worked on ESSER 3, depending on which funding sources you're using, because it's not consolidated. So you do need to kind of keep track of it separately. Um, and then also, if you have, I know some of you have started your, are starting your ventilation um, projects in ESSER 2, and you're continuing them on into um, ESSER 3. So you want to just make sure that um, you keep documentation of the costs that, you're, that are related to your ESSER 2 project, and that you're, and if you did some with your CRF funds, you want to just keep track of all that and evidence that, you know, if you had to show evidence of this was ESSER funded with ESSER 1, or this was funded with ESSER 2, you just want to keep track of that. Um, we're not asking for it, and we're just trying to think ahead in case you do have to report out on it, you have it and you're not scrambling trying to find that. Um, and if you already are, great, you're, one, you're, you're ahead of the game. Um, and then meaningful consultation with stakeholders and opportunities for public comment for both ARP use of funds plan and the SAU plan for safe return to in-person instruction. Um, and I have to say that I had a really good conversation with the district um, and we were trying to outline the process for this. Um, and what happened was she, this person was talking about how they were going to create the plan and then they were going to present it at a school board. And then that was gonna be their meaningful consultation and their public comment time. And I said, okay, well, let's think of what a, what a um, what a reasonable person would think. If you already have your plan um, and you're just getting meaningful consultation and public comment at the same time, when do you have time to um, look at the comments, look at that a meaningful consultation and then implement and then put it into your plan? Because in the in the um, in the guidance it says, and in the law it says that you need to take into account your meaningful consultation if there's any input. And then you also need to take into account any public comments. So if you're doing it all at one time, you know, what would a reasonable person think? When did you have time to implement any of that public comment or meaningful stakeholder groups? And then in regards to the meaningful stakeholder groups, if you check off those meaningful stakeholder groups and you're gonna, you're gonna choose the ones that are most relevant to your community, to your school community, you wanna make sure that if you check a certain stakeholder group, that somewhere you keep evidence that you actually had meaningful consultation with that stakeholder group. And if you're doing that, great. It's just a reminder because again, I wouldn't want anyone to be scrambling and trying to find that evidence um, if they need to have it for reporting purposes or if they need it um, in case we get audited. Um, and I think that's it for that bullet. And then the last one is, um, Try to think about when you are choosing your student groups in 2A and 2B, 
just try to think about evidence of why you were selecting those particular groups for that targeted intervention. Um, again, you don't need to submit anything to us at this point, but just think about that if somebody came by and said, well, why did you choose this particular group for this um, you know, evidence-based, targeted evidence-based intervention, you can say, oh, we did it because of this and this. Um, and just keep that in mind when you're choosing um, your student groups. And then the publicly available plans, um, this is the same slide I used in the last presentation, but I just wanted to stress that um, in the law, there are two plans. There's the ESSER use of funds plan, and then there's the SAU return to in-person instruction and continuity of services plan. Many of you already had the um, return to in-person instruction plan because you had to have that to start school last year. Um, many of you have combined the plans together, which is okay. You just have to make sure that you have all the components of both plans and both of your, and that one plan. Um, and both plans need to be um, publicly available on your web on your website. So what I've been doing um, when I review plans is I don't really I don't read your plans. I just make sure that the website that you've provided has both the ARP use of funds plan and also the safe return to in-person instruction plan. And what I have found, um, and I've probably reviewed about 25 plans, is that um, many of you have the safe returned in-person instruction plan, but it's really, I haven't been able to find the use of funds plan. And so you wanna make sure that you have both on your website. Um, and some districts have both, it's clear to see, it's a summary page of the use of funds plan, and then they have their safe return to in-person instruction plan. We as a department are not reviewing your plans. We're not reviewing your safe return to in-person instruction plans. We're just making sure that it's publicly available on the website that you provide to us. Um, the particulars of the plan, that's what you're signing off on when you check those assurance boxes in the application. Um, and then your ESSER use of funds plan, that's just a summary of what your application is. And so that we are looking at um, to make sure that all the allowable uses and um, allowable and all the pieces of the legislation have been met. On this page, I also put the references to the um, IRFR, um, so you can actually go directly there and see where we're getting this information from. And like I said, we have been getting some questions from um, districts about, um, you know, what's the requirement for the safe return to in-person instruction plan? And the department right now, we are limited by what the um, what our jurisdiction is as outlined in the law, and so we can't do anything that is not that is not allowed statutorily. And so that's what we're trying to stick with um, when we are looking. You know, we get the questions from the safe about the safe return to in-person instruction. So I kind of looked at the IFR and I just kind of summarized it. Now there are more than five. Um, kind of pieces to the IFR, but I kind of tried to pick out the ones that were most relevant to the questions um, that people are asking. And so it must be reviewed every six months and you have to seek public input um, every time the plan is reviewed, um, um, determining whether and what revisions are necessary. And there are two um, citations that I put in here that go directly to the IFR. Um, must the plan must describe the extent which it has adopted the key prevention and mitigation strategies identified in the guidance, which is I also provided um, a citation there. Um, three current or revised plan must continue to address safety recommendations from the CDC, including updated guidance. Um, and the key word here is address, and that's where we're getting all of our. Um, kind of our direction is in that term address. Um, and then four, I must provide useful information that addresses the most up-to-date research on COVID-19 prevention and mitigation. And then the last one is must be in an understandable and uniform format. Now this citation actually has a couple other bullets underneath it um, when you actually go to the IFR. 
And the second bullet is about if you have students, or sorry, if you have families that um, um, English is not their first language and they would like to have it um, in a translated language, you actually have to try to do that to the extent possible or have an interpreter um, um, uh, translate that for them. And then you also need to provide it into a format that is accessible to um, families. So if you had a family that um, you know, was vision impaired, you might have to do that as well. And it's, but the key part of that is extent possible. So, but it need, needs to be an understandable and uniform format for, um, for all your, in a, for the public. So this is something to, think, to keep in mind. Um, and then I think the last slide is just on relevance and timeliness. Um, you want to make sure that your project descriptions um, make a direct connection to COVID-19 um, and that it's not just, um, I know it's going to sound kind of um, simplistic, but we want to make it as easy as possible to see the connection. So if you literally have to say, you know, this is a, because this will help with um, the sanitation, um, you know, and um, cleaning um, to mitigate any of the COVID-19 virus that might be transmitted, um, something as simple as that, because then we can tie it directly back to there. Um, and this is something that, and the other next bullet is about differentiating between the 10-year capital improvement plan and COVID-19 mitigation. So you really wanna make sure that it's not you have it, you know, a lot of districts have a 10 or 15 year capital improvement. They know what they're going to do over the next 10, 15 years. Make sure that there is a clear um, understanding that what you're doing for capital improvement is related to COVID and not because, oh, well, we needed, you know, our roof was, you know, deteriorating and we had it on our 10 year plan, but now we're going to do it with COVID with, um, you know, ESSER funds. So make sure that it is related to COVID-19. Um, and if you're already doing this, um, you know, keep doing it. But these are things that I'm picking out. And um, as I've said in the last couple office hours, a lot of these highlights are just to um, speed up the process when we're reviewing that we don't have to have as much as much as back and forth. If we read it and we're like, yep, it's good. We don't need to have any more clarification. But the back and forth happens when we're not sure there's a, uh, the clarity or we're not sure of the connection back to COVID. And then again, I just threw this out there because I've been seeing it a couple of times and I just wanna make sure that, um, you know, I've only, I've only read about 25 ap applications and I know there's a lot more coming in and just make sure that you differentiate between ADA compliance and COVID-19 mitigation. So for example, if I have a portable that I'm currently using as a classroom and it's not ADA, it's not, up, it's not really up to ADA compliance and I wanna use ESSER funds to, to put a ramp that you can't use ESSER funds for that because that was an ADA compliance that already needed to happen. It wasn't related to COVID. But if, for example, if you have a, a portable that you're not using, but you want to renovate it and you want to make it now into a usable space for students, and as a part of that renovation, you need to update for ADA compliance, then you can use ESSER 3 because that's a part of the renovation um, cost. So that's what, I'm, that's what I'm trying to talk about with ADA compliance. You can't just use it to meet ADA compliance, but you can use it as a part of renovating uh, or um, a space um, so that ADA um, compliance is met, but it's a part of the renovation process. And then the timing list, um, this was stressed a couple of times, and then I went back and actually read um, the IFR again, and it does clearly state that, um, you know, there is an urgent return to safe in-person instruction, and that these funds are supposed to be used to address the needs caused by the pandemic, as quickly, safely, and efficiently as possible. So, you know, I know some of you are trying to be really strategic about, um, you know, planning your funds, and that's that's what we want. We don't want you just to do something and then not be able to sustain it. But we also, you can't wait a couple of years, or you can't put a project in place that's not going to have an impact on students until like two or three years out. So, just think about that when you're planning um, the use of your funds. And I think that is it. Yep. Uh, if there's anyone else on the team that wants to add anything, but we do have resources on this page. And we also have um, the last page is everybody's contact information as well.
So um, please feel free to put your questions in the chat or um, you know, unmute yourself and ask your questions to us. Well, it sounds like everyone is probably very busy um, and uh, we will stay on for a few more minutes. Um, if you have questions, throw them in the chat um, or unmute yourself and we'll stay on for a little bit longer. I know many of you are getting ready for school to start. And so um, you're trying to you know, juggle a lot of balls right now in the air. So we're here to help uh, reach out to any one of us. Uh, but, and uh, that's about it for our presentation. Like I said, we'll stay on for a few more minutes.